Hey y'all, welcome to the start of a new themed reading vlog. In this reading vlog, I'm going to be reading the lowest rated books on my TBR and sharing what I think of these books. I got the inspiration for this after recently reading The Dilemma by B.A. Paris. This was selected as a punishment prompt for my TBR game and after finishing the book, I didn't necessarily understand why it was the lowest rated book on my TBR because I quite enjoyed my reading experience of it. It wasn't necessarily anything mind blowing, but overall I felt like it was a pretty decently done family drama story. And so I was curious curious to see what I would think about the other books on my TBR that were the lowest rated. So I have already started the book that is next in line as the lowest rated and that is The Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix. I've never read anything by Grady Hendrix. He is only on my TBR because I hear such great things about him like with regard to the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires and My Best Friend's Exorcism. None of that had really ever appealed to me before but I wanted to go ahead and give him a shot because it sounds like his books are a mix of like horror and satire or comedy. I thought why not? I had no idea that the Final Girl Support Group was so lowly rated. It is on Goodreads at a 3.56. I started the book today on my way to work, so I'm not very far into it at all. I just wanted to jump on here and kind of give a synopsis and what I'm thinking so far. So as the title suggests, this is following a support group for Final Girls. Final Girls are girls who are the lone survivors of massacres. They have all been part of the support group for the past 16 years, but you can kind of tell at the beginning of this that the group is starting to fray. Some of them want to leave the group and go in their own directions. They don't really feel like it's serving their purposes anymore. Then one of the final girls ends up dead and it kind of goes from there. The book is told from the perspective of one of the final girls, Lynette. And so you are seeing everything from her viewpoint. But what I'm finding really entertaining about this book so far is that as you're finding out more about the other final girls, you can tell that their stories are inspired by classic horror films. So far, I've already learned about one whose story was inspired by Friday the 13th. And I just recently heard about the one that was inspired by Scream and I'm getting a real big kick out of this. I was a huge horror movie lover back in my day. I don't really watch them anymore, but I was a huge fan of Friday the 13th and Scream. So far, it is definitely a really interesting mix of horror and satire almost. And I'm enjoying the reading experience so far. Like I said, I don't I don't really know the point or the purpose of the book. I'm not sure what direction it's going to take, but as of this moment, I am here for the ride. And our main character, Lynette, is definitely a very paranoid individual. She really feels like the whole world is out to get her. And so she leads a very solitary, protected life. And then all of that is now coming to a head as some of these final girls are being killed. And she believes that she is the next target or one of the next targets. But I will go ahead and update you when I'm either more into the book or have finished the book. I don't imagine that this vlog is going to be super long. It's just going to be a handful of reading updates as I'm reading the book. I wanted to do this kind of like vlog style rather than just formal wrap up style. So I hope that's okay with y'all. So I will continue with the story and let you know what I think. Hey y'all, so I just finished the Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix and I wanted to go ahead and come on here and give you my final overall thoughts. So first I actually wanna talk about the audiobook because I feel like that impacted my experience somewhat. Would I have enjoyed the book more or would have rated the book higher if the audio book had been better? I don't know for sure. I don't know if it necessarily impacted my experience that much, but I did want to mention it. So one of my big pet peeves with audiobook narration is when they don't choose a narrator that is going to accurately fit the main character of the story. So the main character of our story is Lynette Tarkington. She is a final girl and I believe just based on the contextual information that I got from the book, it did not write to say her age. But just based off of the information I received, I'm assuming she's in her late 30s. She's probably 38 or 39 years old. And the audiobook narrator that they chose is obviously older. You can just tell by the sound of her voice. And when I looked her up, I believe she's in her 60s. That is a glaring difference in age. And when the audiobook narrator is so far removed from the actual character, Character, it does affect the way that I view and picture the main character and the events of the story. I cannot even visually picture the character accurately in my head when I'm listening to a 60 year old woman narrating the part of a 38 year old woman. It does, it doesn't work for me. I feel like even though it's a voice actor and even though you're not seeing their face, it's just important to match the voice to the character as you would like in a movie or something want to accurately pick the right visual fit for the movie. On top of that, I will say that she was also a pretty slow narrator. I typically listen to audiobooks on two times speed. That's not the slowest I've ever listened. I used to consistently listen on 2.5 times speed. Sometimes that was just too fast. Like I wasn't necessarily able to grasp all details that fast. So now I consistently listen at two times speed, but I found that I was able to easily bump it up to 2.3 times speed 
and then even 2.5 and beyond because of how slowly she narrated. And even if you're not somebody who typically speeds up your audiobooks, I think you're going to need to just to be able to stand to listen to this. So I had a lot of technical issues with the audiobook. Like I said, do I know if that would have changed my overall enjoyment of the story? I don't know. In general, I feel like this book was a really fun time. I really enjoyed the way that Grady Hendrix was inspired by these classic cult horror films that we all know and love to give the backgrounds of these characters. And I like the way that he was able to include satire within the story and still craft a story that was pretty decent as a horror and did have some actual heart pounding moments. So overall I did like the concept of the story. The execution in some places was a little bit lacking. There was a portion of this book that got weird and I thought that it might be going in this really unusual direction but it ended up only being a small portion of, of the story so it only lost me for a short time and it got right back on track but I felt like that part could almost be entirely removed and not hinder the story at all probably would make it better and make it flow because there were just certain things that were just really out there really weird didn't know why that they were included and it kind of took me out of the story and I wasn't connecting to it as much during those parts but like I said overall I thought that this was a pretty fun reading experience. I gave it a four stars. I feel like that's rounded up. I feel like it's probably more of a 3.5, 3.75, but this was just a good time. I really had a good time throughout the entirety of the story. And even now during the workday, after I finished the book, I keep thinking about certain things about it and certain scenes, and I'm glad to have read it. I definitely don't think that this book deserves to be the lowest on my TBR or anybody's TBR. It definitely wasn't that bad. And if you are interested in a book that's going to be a good, campy, fun, but thrilling time I would I would recommend this absolutely especially if you do want some of those nostalgic vibes related to those horror movies so overall like I said such a really good time I don't think that this is going to be my last experience with Grady Hendrix I do want to read the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires I think that's probably the one that I'm going to read and then possibly keep an eye on things that he releases in the future so overall I would say that this was a win so I'm going to go ahead and stick with my four-star rating on Goodreads round it up and move on to the next book in this vlog which is The Replacement Wife by Darby Kane. I read Pretty Little Life by Darby Kane and I really enjoyed that story so I'm excited to see where this goes but nervous that it is now the lowest book on my TBR at a 3.59. So we'll see if it lives up to that very first book but I'm definitely interested in seeing what Darby Kane does with the story. I don't know terribly much about it but once I've started and have a better grasp, I will give you an update. Hi y'all, just wanted to come on and give a quick update because I have started book number two of this vlog, which is The Replacement Wife by Darby Kane. In this story, we're following Elisa. She is married. She's the mom of a young child and she starts to suspect her brother-in-law, Josh, her husband's brother, of possibly being a killer. Josh has one dead wife, a missing fiance, and he's already started to date something new. And Elisa seems to be the only one that is concerned about this questionable pattern. Everybody else seems to believe that the death of the wife was an accident and that the fiance up and left Josh and that there's really nothing suspicious about this. Elisa is not convinced. However, Elisa is also not exactly stable. About 11 months prior to the start of this book, she experienced a trauma which definitely shook up her life and drastically changed her. Seems like she does have post-traumatic stress. She has trouble sleeping. She has panic attacks. She basically doesn't go anywhere. She stays home and though she is able to like get up and for the most part function on a day-to-day -day basis. She's able to be a mom. She does work part-time from home. She is not the same. She still has problems and every now and then it's just really hard for her to function. And we're kind of following her as she is trying to figure out what happened to Josh's wife, what happened to Josh's missing fiance. And she is not keeping quiet about her feelings. This is not a secret. She's confronted Josh about her suspicions. She has discussed this with Harris. And she's also well aware of what gaslighting is because she feels like Harris and Josh are both trying to make her seem like she's crazy, that there's nothing there, that this is about her issues and not Josh. And she continues to say, I'm not crazy. I'm not going to be gaslit. So there is definitely a self-awareness about this book that makes you wonder what direction it's going to take. Is it really as straightforward as Josh is responsible for the death and disappearances of these women and so you should be suspicious of him? Should you be suspicious of Elisa? Is she really an unreliable narrator or is she being gaslit? There is also the introduction of Josh's new girlfriend Rachel who I have a feeling is probably more involved in this than anybody is suspecting at this time. Of course, I don't know how she fits in, but I'm very much suspicious of her. At this moment, I am enjoying this immensely. This is one of those stories where you really don't know who to trust. You don't know who to believe. You don't know what is a red herring and what is not. 
I know that there are a lot of complaints when gaslighting is used in a story, but gaslighting actually happens. Gaslighting actually happens, especially to women, where they are made to think that they are crazy, that what they're saying or seeing is not real and that they need to get help. And I feel like it does go well with thrillers, especially where you are not sure if you are supposed to trust the narrator or not. I'm not necessarily a fan of an unreliable narrator. So as of right now, I'm choosing to believe that she is not unreliable because when you are, when you are reading the story, you are aware that she definitely does have issues related to the trauma, but she doesn't seem to be an irrational or unreasonable woman. I feel like any one of us, if we had somebody in our lives with this very suspicious pattern of missing and dead females, we would also question that. I feel like it's more unusual that nobody else but her is questioning that. So I'm not getting the feeling that she is crazy or that she shouldn't be questioning these things. So it's interesting because I'm trusting her as the narrator. I'm choosing to believe that she is going to be a reliable narrator, but yet I'm not believing what she thinks is actually the case. I believe that there is more to it. So I feel like that's going to be the twist when you find out what is actually real and what is not. And like I said, I am along for the ride. I'm very much enjoying it. I'm really interested to see why this has such a low rating. Is it because of the gaslighting or is there something more? I know that this is a very big departure from Darby Kane's first book which was Pretty Little Wife. In that book you have a very strong confident woman who knows what she did is not sorry about what she did. She's not taking any crap from anybody not even the police. I liked that she was unwavering and so Elisa is definitely very very different from that first main character and I think that that could be a big reason why some people didn't like this book because they were expecting a female character similar to the first book and not what we're getting. And right now, of course, Elisa is not necessarily coming off as a super strong character. But like I said, I don't necessarily consider her to be unreliable. So as of right now, I don't know where this is going. I don't know who I'm supposed to trust, who I'm not supposed to trust. And I'm digging it. I'm really enjoying my reading experience of this. But that's my update for right now. I'll be sure to keep you posted once I'm done. Hey y'all, it is Friday afternoon. I just got off of work and I'm about to head to the gym. But before I did, I wanted to go ahead and give you an update because I did finish The Replacement Wife by Darby Kane this morning. And I feel like I read a different book than everybody else on Goodreads because with a 3.59 average rating, this book is getting some fairly mediocre to low reviews. And I'm not sure I understand because from the very beginning of this book, I was hooked and I just wanted to keep turning the pages. I was invested throughout the entire thing and was just very anxious to see what happens. And I feel like that's a hallmark of a great thriller. Like even if there is no big twist or even if the twist doesn't surprise you, if it keeps you that engaged and entertained, it is a solid read. And I felt like this was absolutely a solid read. Now, I do know a lot of the main complaints was about the gaslighting that I mentioned in my previous clip. But again, I felt like there was a huge self-awareness about that. And because there was that huge self-awareness, it wasn't as big of a deal as if like the main character was fully doubting herself. There were those moments where she definitely was because she understands what the trauma did to her and it affects her ability to function sometimes and think normally and rationally. And because of that self-awareness, I don't feel like it was as impactful as it could have been otherwise. So yes, I enjoyed this one immensely. I'm giving it a solid four stars. I will say that the ending kind of lost me a little bit just because there was an implausibility about the ending with regard to the whole who and the why. Now I feel like Darby Kane could have taken the who and just adjusted the motive and it would have been a whole lot better but the actual motive was very out of nowhere for me. I didn't really feel like it fit with the story all that well and so I had a hard time believing it. I think that there was a lot more that Darby Kane could have done and then of course after the big reveal after the story climaxed it really fizzled out quickly. It was all wrapped up quickly, resolved very nicely. I did think in the end and it wrapped up a little bit too neatly, but really those are my main complaints. So this is another one that I really just don't believe deserves to have a space as the lowest on my TBR. I just don't. So, so far two out of two books that I've read for this vlog have not been a disappointment like I thought that they were going to be. So happy about that. Now, one book that I was shocked to see is the lowest on my TBR is Fool Me Once by Ashley Winstead. She wrote In My Dreams I Hold a Knife, which was a fantastic dark academia thriller. And so that I believe was her debut novel. And so for her sophomore novel, she decided to write a rom-com. Now, everybody that I follow on booktube that has read this book has really enjoyed it. But again, it's got a 3.59 rating, which means it's getting mediocre to low reviews. And that makes me nervous. I have started it. I've literally only listened to about 15 minutes. So I have absolutely no opinion whatsoever. I do know that this is probably going to be like a hate to love romance. From what I understand, the main character is a pretty toxic person and that this book is filled with unlikable characters that you're not necessarily wanting to root for, but you root for anyway. That's a lot of their complaints. Like the main character is pretty unlikable and that she's a cheater and that they, that they didn't really like that. And I believe that there are some political aspects to this that I'm a little bit concerned about, especially if it takes up the whole of the story and it 
ends up being more preachy or Ashley Winstead using the book as like a political platform. But again, I don't know. I'm just basing these statements on some of the comments that I've seen about the book. I have yet to form my own opinion because like I said, I've only listened to about 15 minutes. So we'll see. Anyway, y'all, I've got to go ahead and head to the gym now and then we're going out to dinner. I will check in with y'all when I have more to say on Fool Me Once by Ashley Winstead. Hey y'all, it is Saturday morning and I just wanted to quickly pop on here to let you know that I've officially made the decision to DNF Fool Me Once by Ashley Winstead. Now I only got 12% into the book. Typically if I haven't gotten very far into the book when I make the decision to stop, I don't like to call it a DNF because I haven't really invested a lot of time and energy into it. I typically like to be a fair amount of the way through the book and stop reading it before I consider it a DNF. When I stop it so early on the book, it's kind of like a trial. Like, okay, let me try this out and see. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. However, because it is a book that I'm supposed to be reading for this vlog and I'm not going to, I am going to consider it an official DNF. So when I was looking at the comments for this book on Goodreads, some of what I saw indicated that this book was almost equally political as it was rom-com or maybe even more political than it was rom-com. I really despise when an author uses their books or whatnot to become their political platform. I can handle politics and books if it is a natural part of the plot if it meshes well with the plot and doesn't override the plot. Now if this book is supposed to be like a second chance hate to love romance and we're following the characters as they reconnect over a political issue, mentioning the political issue every now and then is one thing. But having it be front and center all the time is another and already 12% of the way in, Ashley Winstead is calling one side of the political spectrum the dark side and how they need to turn their state of Texas a different color. When an author does that, when an author focuses on the merits of one side and completely demonizes the other, I think it's very misleading, misguided, and that type of divisive language just adds to the turmoil that America already sees with its politics. Both sides have extreme faults. Neither one of them is perfect. And at this point in my life, I don't even think either one is better than the other. And I can't handle the divisive language. I think it just adds to a lot of the divisive rhetoric we have in our country. So I didn't like that. I didn't appreciate it at all. And if that was going to be how the whole entirety of the book went, I just wasn't going to deal with it. So at 12% of the way in, I have DNF'd Fool Me Once by Ashley Winstead. And I think I'm just going to stick to her thrillers. You know, I've only read one by her. It was in my dreams. I hold a knife and it was absolutely fantastic. And I've heard nothing but great things about The Last Housewife. And so I'm going to assume that she is amazing with the thriller genre. But if this is how her rom-coms are going to be, I'm just going to steer clear. So the next book on the list is Find Me by Ella Fair Burke. I have never read an Ella Fair Burke, but Audrey from Chapter and Converse loves this author and raves about her. And so I wanted to give her a shot. But the book that I'm reading, I think is actually her newest release. I think it's one that came out this year and it's at a 3.59, just like Fool Me Once was. So again, you know, I'm going in with trepidation. I'm cautious about it, but I started it last night and I was really enjoying what I was reading. Like I was flying through it and I'm very intrigued to find out what happens. So the book is centered around Hope, who 15 years prior to the start of the book was in a horrific car accident and lost her memory and her memory never returned. And so she has just been living in this town, building a new life. And she's built this really great friendship with a woman named Lindsay. Now at the start of this book, Hope has recently moved away from the town where she and Lindsay became so close because she kind of wants her freedom. She wants to branch out on her own and make sure that she can, you know, actually survive on her own. But after not hearing from Hope for a few days, Lindsay is very concerned. And so she goes to where Hope moved. I believe it was to like the East Hamptons or something. And Hope is nowhere to be found. And she's trying to incite some concern into like the local law enforcement and things like that. And her investigating kind of leads to this connection with a serial killer out of Kansas. So she's now trying to get in contact with a detective who was the daughter of the man who investigated the serial killer. So I'm very intrigued to see what the connection is, how Hope is connected to a potential serial killer in Kansas. And, you know, she doesn't really remember anything and she is now gone. And so Lindsay can't ask her. So Lindsay's having to do all of this investigation. So, so far, I am very intrigued. At the start of this, it feels very bingeable. Like Alifair's writing feels very bingeable. You're definitely following Lindsay's perspective. You're following the perspective of the detective. And I think you're going to also follow a couple of other perspectives as well. So, so far, it's been a positive experience. I definitely plan on continuing this weekend. So I actually have to start getting ready because I have a nail appointment and then Robert and I are going to the Celtic Music and Highland Games festivals that are on the fairgrounds near us. Don't know how long we're going to be there or how interesting it's going to be, but we're going to check it out because it'd be the first time that we ever did. So I'm going to go ahead and get ready and grab my coffee and things like that. And I will check in with you when I have more thoughts on Find Me. Hey y'all, it is Tuesday morning and I actually had some time before leaving for work today. So I thought I would go ahead and give you all a reading update rather than sitting in my car and doing it right before I go into work. So I ended up finishing 
Find Me by Ella Fair Burke. And I really, really enjoyed that story. It was a solid four stars. It had me engaged and gripped throughout the entirety of the story. And I would definitely say that this is a binge worthy book. It's compulsively readable. I would probably give it a designation of a popcorn thriller just because it's delicious and you don't want to put it down. I don't know what Archie is doing in the background. So if you're hearing weird noises, that is him doing something he is not supposed to be doing. So yes, overall, I really enjoyed that story. I'm not entirely sure why it's got only a 3.59 rating on Goodreads because I thought that it was a pretty solid story and it was actually pretty intricate. There were definitely quite a few characters that you had to keep track of and you had to keep track of different timelines and how it was all connected so it could get a little bit confusing but overall I found it pretty easy to keep straight. Normally that stuff would be really confusing and I would kind of lose track of who was who and what the connections were. But overall, I found it pretty easy to keep track of. I think the only confusion I felt was that sometimes I had a tough time distinguishing Lindsay from Ellie. So Lindsay was kind of the main character of the story. She was Hope's best friend and she was the one that was spearheading the search for Hope. And then Ellie was the detective that she reached out to in New York for assistance with that cold case out of Kansas. So sometimes their voices got intermingled in my head and I was getting one of their backgrounds confused with the other. But otherwise, I felt like it was very solid and definitely more complex than I was originally expecting it to be. And then there was a like one little twist at the end that I would say was possibly a little bit predictable. You could probably see it coming throughout the entirety of the story, but I still like that it was thrown into the end for good measure. I had to put my arm down, y'all. It does not like holding the camera up for a length, any length of time and it gets shaky. So I have started my fifth and final book of this vlog. It's called The Last Vanish by Megan Miranda. Now me and Megan Miranda have a history. I have read several books by her and I am never blown away by her books. And oftentimes I have a pretty significant amount of criticism. And the last book that I read by her was Such a Quiet Place. And I didn't really like that one at all. I thought it was super boring. I wasn't engaged or connected with that story, but there's always something that keeps me coming back to her books. With the exception of Such a Quiet Place, I'm usually fairly entertained by them. And even though they don't blow my mind and they're never really truly shocking or anything of that nature, I just keep wanting to pick them up. So am I surprised that one of her books is the lowest rated on my TBR? Actually, no. Do I expect to enjoy this more than everybody else has? Probably not based on my history with her books, but I'm definitely going to give it a shot. So The Last to Vanish is set in a small mountain town in North Carolina called Cutters Pass. And it's actually quite a notorious town because it is such a small little place, but yet the number of people that have gone missing there is very disproportionate to its small population. So it's considered like the most dangerous town in North Carolina. So like 20 years prior to the start of this story, four fraternity brothers went missing. And then since that time, I think about three other people have gone missing as well. And their disappearances all seem to be connected with this one specific hiking trail that is now known as the Vanishing Trail. Cutters Pass is kind of a touristy destination because it's settled right near the Appalachian Mountains. And so people go to stay there to, you know, take advantage of the trails, including that notorious trail. And that trail actually butts up right against the Passage Inn, which is one of the main settings of this story. And our main character seems to be Abigail, who has worked at the Passage Inn for the past 10 years. And she's not a native to Cutters Pass, so she's kind of always felt like an outsider, but she's really made herself a home in Cutters Pass over the past 10 years and has really grown to love it and the people. And she has definitely witnessed some of the disappearances that have happened over the past couple of years. And the most recent disappearance was four months prior when a journalist named Landon West came to kind of research these disappearances. And now, four months later, his brother Trey, I believe is his name, comes looking for him. And I, I'm not terribly far into the story. I'm only nine chapters in, so I'm not really sure the trajectory that this is going to take. I'm not sure the overall plot of the story. It seems like Abigail and Trey might team up to see if they can find out what happened to Landon and some of the other people that have disappeared. So like I said, I have no idea what direction the story is going to take, but what I'm really liking so far is the atmosphere. If you all have been watching my channel recently, you know that I'm a very big fan of those wintry isolation thrillers. I think that it adds intensity to thrillers, definitely a survivalist aspect as well. And so I'm kind of getting some of those vibes, even though it's not necessarily 100% isolation because there are other people, but they're in this very super small town that can often feel cut off from the world. And they definitely have electricity and phone problems during storms and things of that nature. I'm not necessarily super connected to the story yet. Like it's not keeping me actively engaged, but I'm really intrigued to see what is going to happen and to see where it goes. And I 
just hope I like it better than such a quiet place. I really do. But anyway, y'all, that is the update. I have to finish the last few things I've got to do before heading out to work. I was just super thrilled to have some time to actually film in my home before leaving today. And I will check in with you when I've actually finished this book for the final update of the vlog. Hey y'all, I just finished The Last of Vanished by Megan Miranda, and so I am here to give you the final update for this vlog. So as I mentioned in a previous clip, this is set in a small mountain town in North Carolina that is pretty infamous for the number of disappearances that it has had over the past 20 or so years. The main character is Abigail. She is not a native to the town. She has spent the past 10 years there working and building a life and trying to fit in. So she wasn't there for all of the disappearances, but she was there for the most recent two, I believe. And at the start of the novel, she's working at her job at the Passage Inn when Trey West walks in. And Trey West is the brother of the most recent person to have gone missing, who is Landon. And he's a journalist who is there kind of looking into the disappearances. This book really follows Abigail as she starts to question things and starts to look into these disappearances. It's not something that she has ever really done before, but Trey's arrival sparked with something she uncovers on her own, makes her really interested in finding out what happened to all seven of the people that have gone missing. Overall, I would say I was pleasantly surprised by this book. It is definitely not my least favorite Megan Miranda. In fact, I would probably say it is one of my top favorites. It's likely the atmosphere that really did it for me because I'm such a huge fan of those wintry isolation thrillers. And so the atmosphere really did it for me, especially like right now as we're getting into winter and it's cold and cozy. I will say that this reads definitely more like a mystery and not a suspense thriller. It is definitely not fast paced. It's not edge of your seat. You're really just trying to uncover the mystery of what happened with these disappearances. It doesn't start to give you the suspense thriller vibes until the very end as things are revealed field and you're not really sure who's lying and who to trust and things of that nature. I did really enjoy the direction that the story took overall. I liked some of the little twists that Megan Miranda threw in that really added a good dimension to the story. I wasn't necessarily engaged throughout the entirety of my reading of this. I did find myself distracted like it wasn't always holding my attention and so that's why I think I'm going to go ahead and give this a 3.5 rather than a solid 4. I will say that this book really does that thing where it throws a lot of characters at you that have no business being in the book but to be suspects. Like they don't add anything to the overall plot and they don't need to be in the story but they're literally there and mentioned. So you know that they're there and could possibly be suspects. I understand why that has to happen because you have to have a large pool of suspects. Otherwise it makes it entirely too easy to guess who the perpetrator is. So I completely understand that. But at the same time as the reader, I'm like, okay, why were we even introduced to this character? Why was this character's name even mentioned? But then again, you have the situation where the character who actually did it was another one of those names. Megan Miranda wants you to have this large cast of characters where you're thinking in the back of your mind, okay, this character could have done this. So I get it. It's annoying, but I understand it at the same time. It's complicated, apparently. So yes, I was not disappointed by my reading experience of this at all. I think a 3.5 is fairly solid, especially for Megan Miranda, who is an author that I have such an up and down history with. And while this one didn't necessarily hold my attention the entire time, it was a decent read. And I'm pretty glad that I read it. So in sum, out of the five books that I read, four of the books ended up being quite a pleasant surprise for me. I enjoyed them more than I thought I would given their ratings and some of the comments that I saw. I did DNF fool me once, but you can't win them all. So overall, this was definitely a success. And that's it for this vlog, y'all. It is time for me to head into work and start my day. I hope that you enjoyed. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these books and what you thought, if your thoughts were similar to mine. And I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.